but I, I always just try and get that inner mantra of you can't control what you can't control is as disappointing as it was and I think as unnecessary as it was if the contract tracing was as good as they say then we wouldn't have all had to shut down and regional Victoria shouldn't have been shut down and all those things but you know it is what it is. Today on Dirty Linen we're feeling pretty good because Victoria has come out of lockdown it was a short sharp five-day grind and I've lured onto the show someone I've been wanting to chat to for a while. She is a long-time restaurateur in Melbourne. Her name is Barb Diet, and she owns Chicholina in St Kilda. Welcome, Barb, and we're out of lockdown number three. Hi, Danny. We sure are out of lockdown number three. I'm just about to do takeaway again for the last time, hopefully, and pivot my restaurant again. <laughs> You're getting pretty used to that, aren't you? And we just do it with a bit of complacency now. It's a bit like we learned in the first lockdown, you can't control what you can't control. So you sort of have to just take a big deep breath and, and pivot and pivot and pivot and do what you can do just to keep people fed and doors open, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Chicholina is such a community institution. It's, I mean, I think you, you probably really know the people that you're feeding, that you're looking after, and in turn they know you and they know the people that are bringing them the Chicholina experience, don't they? They really do. We've we've been eternally blessed. When we opened, you know, 450 years ago, we went. <laughs> we want to feed the locals because we want to. They're your sort of repeat customers. They're not the special occasion people. They're the ones that might eat there once or twice a week. And so we've sort of always had that focus. That's why we didn't have bookings for a long time. Thank you, COVID, brought us bookings in. And now, um, and so they've always looked after us, and we've looked after them too. So we feel pretty privileged in a position where, even though lockdown 1.0 was completely insanely torture it was um it was we felt supported the whole way people were coming through the doors and buying takeaway to support us you know in Vern Cottons which is fantastic so yeah we did we've kept it open yep and so when um that was lockdown one and then there was lockdown two and she was a she was a ripper but (laughs) lockdown three how did that strike you I mean what's that been like it was actually a funny one because I was working we we were actually weren't sure whether we were more angry at the bomb or more angry at um the lockdown because the bomb we've got now due to COVID a quite an extended outdoor area so we're very fortunate I always feel very sorry for the people in the city of Melbourne that haven't been able to sort of seize that opportunity because outdoor definitely has changed a lot and people prefer to sit outdoors and the bomb said it was going to be raining all day Friday anyway and um and it wasn't it was really sunny so there was uh, you know, all hands on deck and we're running, running, running. But the funny thing was I got a sniff that there'd be a lockdown. Everyone else was convinced there wasn't or hadn't heard anything. And then, you know, it, you know, it took us all a bit by surprise. And But we had a couple of um, Labor staffers of an MP sitting on one of the tables who I know quite well. Oh. And I was running and I said, give me the updates as they come in. And they were going, yep. Yeah. They had to run back to the office obviously too, but they were watching the presser, shoving their food down and then running back to work. And they were going, five kilometres, run, run, run. Uh, midnight lockdown, run, run, run. And I was just going, all I could think about was netball was starting that night for my kids. And I went, <sighs> what's going to happen with netball? I just sort of didn't even really think about work for once. Oh, my God. So it was good. So, we, yeah, and everyone came, every man and his dog had their last – supper again you know we're not going to be able to bleed here for a few days and blah 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 so anyway so they all came and ate it was heaving busy um which I feel lucky about because we weren't in that same position a lot of people had with produce and all that sort of stuff right and And we worked and worked and shut as soon as we'd on all our bookings so I actually had a dinner booking myself that night somewhere and I cancelled sorry Francois (laughs) I haven't been I've cancelled six times because of COVID with these people I'm trying to catch up with so I thought we shouldn't go because someone else will want to eat there and someone else will eat our food and I had to turn the restaurant to take away anyway so yeah so that's what Friday looked like for us but I, I always just try and get that inner mantra of you can't control what you can't control it's, as disappointing as it was and I think as unnecessary as it was if the contract tracing was as good as they say then we wouldn't have all had to shut down and regional Victoria shouldn't have been shut down and all those things but you know it is what it is so Mm. It is what it is. And I had noticed, you know, the week prior that you had already been planning takeaway Valentine's Day boxes. Yeah, we've because of the modified numbers and our we're not jumping to maximum numbers straight away because we've got the outdoor area. We're sort of we're, we're trading at a capacity that we're comfortable with, that our customers are comfortable with. 
and um you know everyone's discussed this before on your podcast and things like that we've got staff that we really love and try and look after and they have the same COVID fears that other people have and so if you're packing them in like we did before COVID in like sardines in at Chichilina no one's comfortable so we've not ex- put our full capacity back we've extended over four areas and we just want to sort of keep a pace going so then to supplement revenue obviously we went well what would people like to do it wasn't planning for a lockdown it was planning for extending the way that we could sell our product and, mm. and, and people responded really well to our occasional boxes that we did have a lockdown so we just wanted to keep that going yeah really yeah, yeah. interesting it's been such a feature of Chichilina that it has been no bookings. I feel like you were the first restaurant that really did that and made it, a, you know, a point of difference. Oh, that, all credit that, it was Ekachina. We just copied Ekachina. Okay. Put on your mic, so yes. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Um, so you copied from one of the best. Uh, mm. So, what's it been like to take bookings? I think it's good because there's been a couple of reasons. Um, the main reason is that our demographic is aged and people aren't really comfortable waiting up to two and a half hours for a table, which was, you know, at our peak of, of stupidity, that's what people were waiting for and drinking a lot in the back bar. And, and I think just realising those days are gone, we don't really want to have that sort of heaving bar culture while there's such a risk to the community, to our staff. So it was a way of making sure our, our regulars were comfortable, that they could definitely get in and they could still support us and we can support them and maximize our numbers because everyone as you've said many times everyone's really comfortable supporting the restaurants the best way they can so they want to make sure they're in and out they eat quickly we can get more sittings in and you know for half the capacity so you're taking the same approximately the same revenue but with two sittings rather than you know sort of a disjointed service that you're not quite sure how Mm. it's going to go it's more of a guarantee of revenue for us so i don't think bookings will disappear for us now that's interesting. Mm. So, I mean, do you think you'll just do them on some nights or book some areas of the restaurant or what do you think you'll do? No, we, we'll probably keep it the way that it is. It might um, uh, tweak it a bit over winter when we lose our outdoor area, but it's more that um, we only book at about two-thirds and so we've always got a bit of capacity for walk-in as well or yeah, for right. people who are really enjoying themselves to stay. You know, so yep. you, can, you know, you don't have to rush. There's no one booked on your table. So it's just a lot of Tetris all night and day, but it's... It means people are look after, looked after, which, which sort of keeps everyone happy. Interesting. And have you tweaked the menu much to accommodate the new conditions? Um, since COVID? Yeah. 100%. I think a lot of people have said this, and I am, except for COVID, except for the lives that it's taken of people we know and, and the other devastating things that have happened, I, I mean, this is a topic I've discussed with you personally. Um, the business model was flawed in hospitality for a really long time and a lot of people were going down the gurgler in different ways and I noticed some of your guests say things like you know we how long can you keep going before you don't make money and it's not a charity so it gave us the first lockdown a chance to really time to look at your business model and go why are we doing this what are we doing um you know I mean I don't want to be flying Learjets and you know traveling all the time we're just happy to have one or two holidays a year and you know, put food on our table quite basically because we do. We don't make lots of money, but we it just gave us a chance to go, well, we are here to sort of make money. We're getting older now. So it gave us a, uh, you know, food costing, which we'd never done before. We just sort of were busy. So we put food on the plate and went, yeah, that's what we'll charge. So now we're charging, like a lot of people say, to cover – we've always done proper wage costs, so that's fine, but to cover – good wage costs to cover the real price of produce, to cover um, the real price of rent. You know, rent's exorbitant. So if people want to eat your produce and it's a good produce, they ha- as, as many people on your, your guests have said before, they have to recognise that's what they have to pay for it. And, and if you are offering quality product, product, I believe they'll pay for it. So how much and have you put prices up? Our prices didn't go up as such. We just sort of... Um, Things like we always gave free bread. It was one of our hallmarks that we gave this sort of – we've got a um, Vietnamese French baker in Carlos Street that we've bought from for 25 years. And we've always just dumped free bread on the table. Now, nowhere would you get free bread. One, that was why was it free? Because you should pay for it if it's got a name sort of thing. Two, a lot of people just ate and then didn't eat more food because they were filling up. They got repeat free bread as much as they wanted. And so – now we charge for bread. It's not a, a lot of money, but it makes sense because it complements the meal, doesn't fill people up. And so it's sort of all those tiny things that you do, we looked at every aspect of the business and it's it's tweaked it to the point that it's 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 
workable now. Does that make sense? You know, it's, we yeah, tweaked it's our roster. It's so we interesting. Tweaked, yeah. yeah. We tweaked, we had time to tweak things. You know, after job, we're all saying this, we're all panicking. It was like listening to the radio during the war with uh, Churchill making declarations. We're waiting for JobKeeper to be announced. We're waiting for rent relief to be offered, all those sorts of things. And once all those fantastic systems that we're so privileged in Australia to have, were implemented, you could sort of work on how your business was going to come through this and, and it gave you time because you weren't overly busy. Crazy, but not overly, overly busy enough to sort of look at your business model. So you've also made another enormous change in your business lives through the through COVID and um, you expressed it to me through a really beautiful conversation that you and your daughter were having on the daily um, mm. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, it was just we opened a second restaurant 10 years ago, figuring that we were at capacity here. Um, surely we could fill another venue, which a lot of naive people do. You know, we were just stupidly, all the three of us, I've got two business partners and we all got drunk one night and went, that's a really good idea. But also our lease was coming to an end here. We have, we've got a, a landlord that we've had on hot and cold relationships with over the years who was fantastic during COVID, I might say. Um, and so we thought we'll open across the road, down the road, you know, everyone's moving to Balaclava. So we live in Balaclava ourselves. So we shifted across to there and set up a second restaurant with the view that this one would probably close down one day. But, you know, one a couple of years turned into 10 years. And my daughter says to me that her earliest memory is me dropping her off at kinder, at three-year-old kinder, saying, you know, she's clinging to my leg saying, oh, don't go. And I said, I've got to go. I've got to go to work because we're opening the second restaurant. And as restaurateurs know, it's a sort of 20-hour-a-day job opening a restaurant. You're, you're not really present for your family or anybody. And then she said when um, – she said that's all I remember now during lockdown is you saying, I've got to go to work, got to go to work because we had to work every single day during lockdown doing takeaway to keep the wheels turning, you know, and that's 10 years later. So we just decided – middle of lockdown last year we, we couldn't keep going we couldn't do two businesses it was really bad for our quality of life um my business partner myself another one we we lost one of our closest closest friends and you know in the in the middle of that really full-on um uh curfew mm -hmm. you know he died in the middle of the day I was holding his hand and I was driving back through that curfew and it was just like we're going this is just what are we doing? It's horrible. People are dying and we just went, this has to end. So we were looking after that lockdown of a way that we could gracefully exit after 10 good years, fantastic years at Alona Stoller with beautiful customers and great staff and everything, just to get our quality of life back. You know, all the sourdough bakers on Instagram, I felt like I'd missed out on all of that. <laughs> you know, I didn't have that break. We were just working constantly. So I said, what can we do? And so we approached a landlord and he was really happy to take the building back. So, it went, you know, within a matter of three weeks, bang, it was it was done. It was a sealed deal and we were closed. And and now at the end of the story that you started with, my daughter now says every day, Mum, how many restaurants have you got? And I go, just one today, honey. <laughs> That's really sweet, you know. We've discussed this with a few people before. The only way you can manage multiple venues when you're small-time operators like us is if you're one of those bigger groups that have got centralised admin and centralised sort of kitchens and all those other things that make them do such a fantastic job at it and lower, you know, higher profit margins because it's, as the other people with multiple venues know, it's a really hard slog trying to be in two places and manage 50 staff and manage, you, you know, your quality of your product. Really? Uh, yeah, as a family mm. business and as you so beautifully express, you know, a business that impacts families and, and family life. Um, yeah, mm. it's, you know, uh, the, we we tend to think of the, of closing businesses and moving on from businesses as a, you know, un, unremittingly sad thing, but it is really interesting to get this other perspective. You know, it was a decision that you made very carefully, you know, thinking about priorities I mean, it's, it, it must have been sad to, to say goodbye to Alona Stoller. It was such a big part of the community. But I guess, you know, th there must have been a feeling of relief as well. I always say that because a lot of people, their opening line is, oh, that's really sad. And I go, it's not actually sad for us because for us we feel like we've got our lives back again. I, I will miss heaps of aspects of it. And we've met some lovely people through it. And, and there's that sense of pride that... I don't feel like we failed because we did 10 really successful years and it was fine. But it was a it was a, a family struggle to manage everything. We're always, you know, hyphenated going to work. 
because my partner's a chef and, and we were involved in the business and we it was just non-stop actually non-stop and so it wasn't sad at the end because we were doing 15 eight hour days every single day and and just to get the doors closed you know to to give everyone their final last feed so i just feel like and with lockdown too every time you have to pivot one business you have to pivot two businesses so i do two days at chit and then take a big deep breath go down to a loan and do two days at a loan store to get the business model changed back for open close take away you know it was it was busy draining you know not complaining though you know good quality life on the outside but gee it was busy yeah uh- one thing I think that is good is it seems like some good operators have taken over that spot. It used to be a red rooster before you turned yes. it into a loan and dollar. So I think people in the hood, and it's it's my hood, um, you know, people were very nervous about what might happen, but it looks like it's, it's going to be a restaurant, um, you know, for the community and, yeah, we don't have to... Uh, worry about it turning into a place for fried chicken. No, that was one of the conditions. We didn't really want to go through a sale because we knew that would be particularly tricky. But the landlord's son is involved in, in the group. It's, I mean, it's been published now. It's the Hanoi Hanna group and Tokyo Tina, that group. And so he, I knew he'd be quite keen to discuss it with his son to see if he would want to take over the building because his son grew up in the business and grew up in that building and things like that. So it was a lovely transition. It's gone back to the landlord and it's gone back to the family. So it was sort of I wouldn't I don't think I'd be comfortable and I would be sad if it was going to something tragic, but it's going to be great. Whatever right. they do will be great because they're very practised operators. So what was it yeah. what, um, before it was Red Rooster? What had that building been? It was a state savings bank. That's why the beautiful – it's a big old Art Deco building and the bank manager used to live upstairs. My partner, Virginia, grew up in bank buildings because her dad was a bank manager. He always lived upstairs and managed the branch downstairs. Right, wow. Yeah, so, so it was a state savings bank, so Commonwealth Bank, yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, you've talked about some of the tweaks that you've made to the business in terms of bookings and, and menu choices. What are some of the other issues that you foresee for um, Australian restaurants as we climb out of all of this? I think that the we've said this a lot. That was another reason why we wanted to close one restaurant because you need to really consolidate. You consolidate the you know your staffing, consolidate your control over the business. And I think when all the um, JobKeeper finished for us a while ago because we were trading again at normal figures, but I think a lot of people when JobKeeper finishes and rent relief. I mean, just having to pay rent this month, I just took a massive shock because we. You know, we got 60% rent waived. It was incredibly generous of both of our landlords, but it made us capable of operating. I mean, some nights you're taking $250 for takeaway, so it's, mm. you, need, you needed rent relief or it would have been a disaster. But going back to full rent now, I think a lot of people won't, especially in the city of Melbourne, they will not be able to manage. There's going to be empty, vacant shops everywhere. But one of the benefits we were talking about when we first moved to St Kilda as uni students, you know, when we were sort of 18, 19, um, was that the, there was quite an eclectic mix of shops because rents, when they're vacant for ages, do tend to drop. And independent operators who are quite savvy, you know, on a shoestring can open really quirky, fantastic things. So I think big places will suffer if they're sort of stodgy in their management and their structure. But on the converse side, empty shops will be full of people filling up over the next couple of years of people seizing the opportunity of the discounted rents and the what, um, the need for people want to eat, to eat locally and things like that. So I think it's a long pendulum, but when it swings, it'll be. I think it'll be good for our industry. Yeah, I feel like if you were a young, ambitious restaurateur at the moment, you know, it it could be pretty golden going forward. Hundred percent. I mean, it's almost tempting. We have to smack ourselves and go no, because we've been approached now by a couple <laughs> of people to say will you take over my place because you've only got one now? And I go, no, that, that's the reason we close because we only want one. <laughs> but saying that, we, we might get itchy feet again and go and see something fantastic because I've got a couple of ideas. I think they'd go off. But for the moment, I just get two teenagers through high school or, you know, settle into a <laughs> routine and then I'll think about something to do. But, yeah, I, I think there'll be interesting things opening, you know, you know, as you know, like little wine bars and things with better um, business models, you know, one chef, one waiter maybe, or mm. t- bar service, things where you don't have to overly service a room because wage, wage costs are so expensive and they shouldn't be reduced because, you know, hospitality are on very low wages as it is. I was just going to say, I think it'll be good. It'll be interesting. The landscape will shift, but it'll be, it's not all bad, but it'll be a long wait for it to pick up again. Bob, what is it that you love about being a restaurateur? 
it's really cheesy, but it's one of those things when you do service, when you're on the floor, it's quite fun. It's quite a bit of theatre. And if I'm working with a certain combination of people, we just have a lot of fun, heaps of fun. We've got really fantastic regulars that we enjoy hearing about their lives and things like that. And I think it's a really basic thing because even though I've studied it, and done other things, I really don't mind that you walk in and you do a shift and then it's finished. <laughs> it's, it's over. It's really, it's like a sense of closure. You just do a shift and it's finished. And it's quite quite a nice, a nice basic feeling, you know, a very back to basics feeling of doing things well and finishing them at the end of the day and sleeping, you know. <laughs> That's beautiful. That, mm, I really I love, love that. It. I've never disliked it. We fell into it, but I still love it, yeah. Um, and what do you think about St Kilda? That's obviously changed so much since you opened Chichilina how many years ago? 25? 27, yeah. 27 years ago? Yeah, yeah. So you've seen, you've seen a lot of changes. Um, how do you feel that you fit into the neighbourhood or that the neighbourhood fits around you? I don't think we do really. I've sort of always said that and I don't mean to sound like a snob, but we always say it's like Nostasio. They're just there, but they're essentially their own little um, island. When we opened, there was a the council was more local. It wasn't a big amalgamated council, and there was a thing called retail mix. And every landlord had to um, have a tenant in who was fulfilling the same um, model of business that they'd done before. So, if you're a restaurant, you had to move into a restaurant. So the whole street wouldn't become restaurants, or the whole street wouldn't become pharmacies or whatever. And then that left after it was probably not fair on um, landlords that they had to you know, find someone specific to their restaurant, uh, to their to their shop. But it actually worked and it kept a deli. You know, there was delis, there was mm. florists, there was chicken shops, there was lots of things in Ackham Street. And obviously a lot of high streets changed, but I think that it saved St Kilda for a long time. And then we've shut the stupid street off of the mall and I lost interest in everything council ever did after that because they they don't really listen to what people are doing. They've tried this time round, I have to say, and they've, they've tried, but they, there's so much bureaucracy with... St Kilda that you don't seem to see get a lot of get a lot of things done that people advocate one example we were saying like St Kilda festivals seems to fall on Valentine's Day a lot it's just bizarre Mm. when they say please don't because we can't trade we close on St Kilda festival when half a million people come but they seem to do it on Valentine's Day and we say you're not listening to us it's it's here anyway yeah I don't feel like we're really essentially a part of St Kilda anymore it just it just we just happen to be here it could be anywhere and I think we'd have local loyal people. It's yeah. it's really interesting that um, that trading mix concept and I feel like maybe maybe that was a bit too restrictive but I think, I mean, it, you know, as soon as, as I hear myself saying this, I think, oh, I don't know, but, you know, would it be good if, if um, shopping strips had quotas, like you couldn't have more than 30% of businesses being restaurants, for example? Well, that's it. Why, why do you go to somewhere like Chadston or people go? Because it's got everything you need there. But you're not mm. going to go to a place if it doesn't have other things that you need. I mean, I've spoken to Mark from Readings, who owns Readings, and he, he's always a bit like, I feel like I owe Ackland Street a bookshop, but I can't do it if it's not profitable. When there's no other retail sh- shops surviving in the street, you know, the, the vacancy rate's huge. So yeah, people aren't going to make it a destination to come for a book. And he's paying an exorbitant rent, you know, just to fulfil a community thing. We're not, we're too old to do that for business now. We need to look after ourselves, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, well, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best to keep readings there. <laughs> <laughs> I have two, I've got three in the last two weeks. We're trying. <laughs> One bonus of lockdown is readings, that's for sure. Um, Barb, uh, you and well, your customers really supported the visa workers that I was working with during our big lockdown last year. Um, your customers were kind enough to buy donations for some of those visa workers who'd lost their jobs and, and they were in turn able to come and get takeaway from your restaurant. So thank you so much for that. But it, it's obviously comes out of a place of understanding. You employ many people from overseas and could see that the issues that they were facing what uh, what place do you think internationals have got in the industry? Oh my God, that's almost a foregone conclusion. I was, but I couldn't believe that they weren't supporting visa workers on JobKeeper as well when they're supporting them as, on a visa to eventually become permanent residents and filling a. The basic line was they they're filling a role that we can't fill ourselves. So why would you not encourage them to stay? Because we can't, you can't get a chef overnight. 
they have to do an apprenticeship or at least a year or two of practical experience to be able to cook food. So how who, I don't know how the government thought we were going to fill all these roles and get people back to work when it's actually a qualified position that we're under 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 staff for. It was bizarre to me. Anyway, so I, I we did our best. We kept our visa workers. Um, we couldn't unfortunately keep all of. Um, all of them employed the casuals, but all the people that we'd sponsored, we, we were able to keep on. That Just opening our doors was just that, to pay the rent and to pay the visa workers, really. That's why we muddled through lockdown one and two. And we're gratefully accepting that they're still here and working with us, which is fantastic. Mm, well, I think a lot of people who weren't able to hang on to those people, are, you know, they're obviously struggling for staff now. Everyone's struggling for stuff. And I think that's a small good thing that's come out of the industry is that when uh, we, we ended up with a couple of people at Alone Soul, a lot of people resigned or moved to other um, areas. They didn't want to work in hospitality anymore. We've got a disproportionate amount of people over 40. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, they took long service leave and everything else that was owed to them. And they said, um, the, I said to them, you know, one benefit you have is there's going to be a massive shortfall of staff. When you go to your next job, you can pick and choose what you want. You can say, oh, I don't want to work weekends. Or, and people are going to go, yep, no problem. You'll be able to choose the job that you'd like rather than the job that's dictated for you because you're a skilled worker now and you should be um, looked after. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think it's definitely, it's an employee's market or, you know, it should be. There, people are desperate for, for good good people. So yeah. if you've got the skills and even if you don't, if you're willing to learn, I think no one should be in a position where they're not getting, you know, the, the proper conditions because um, that you, you, people are needed. That's right, yeah. And, and people have, that work for us have, you know, 25 plus years experience or whatever. So they, they've definitely... It's a it's employees market, like you said. They shouldn't be missing out on a job at all. So, I don't know how people when of two people I know friends opened over this period over after lockdown. I went, wow. I just feel for the pain you're going to have to have staffing. Mm-hmm. Oh well, wow! Yeah, well, I think they're in it. Um, Barb, Melbourne's really been through the ringer. We're coming out of the third lockdown. How do you think the vibe's going to be on the street? Are people going to come back out? Are businesses going to hang in there? I, I think they will because um, it was a temporary. Oh, all the cheesy um, cliches. It was a temporary circuit breaker, but also we're blessed with fantastic weather, so it'll be booming. It'll actually boom as long as everyone's on their A game. Um, it's a funny thing. We are talking about social media a few weeks ago. I think that's one of the things that nearly killed me during lockdown. My sister-in-law and brother-in-law have got restaurants in Sydney and they said, uh, can I swear? I won't swear. I can't <laughs> be bothered doing a, a fake smiley post on Instagram today. It's hard work going, hey, guys, we're open. Look, you know, when you're selling four takeaways a night or something. So if people, that's what I find tiring, that you have to be on your A game on social media to get, people generated talking to get you back to the venues and things like that and I still keep thinking about the city of Melbourne I feel for them so badly because people are not returning to the city as much as they'd like you know and if they don't have the big things the big ticket items to bring them in I think people will not come out of this lockdown as well as region you know as suburban and and regional yeah I mean I I think you're absolutely right and you know we had yesterday on the podcast die from hardware society you know close one of Businesses because the people simply aren't there and of course you know it's a short lockdown for sure but it slowed down the return of people to offices the increasing of those quotas but you know yeah. theaters are back at lower capacity so all that kind of stuff is um yeah it's just like another it's just another hit um yeah. so yeah i'll be i'll be jumping on the train and going into the city a lot and doing as doing what well, i same. can we're, we're, we've been doing it as much as we can as when we're off we try and get out and spend money around as much as money as we have to spend but yeah it's just that, like i said about the business model friends and a comedian and she was saying she can't have a theater show unless it's 85 percent capacity yeah. because you, you don't even she'd owe them money and so to to open at, with 75% capacity, it's not worth having a show. So if there's no theatre shows in the city, then people, you know, there's, it's like a, it's a catch-22 for everyone. They can't open until the crowds come back, but they can't open things until the quota goes up, you know. I just, people are, and, and people can't, as Di said on your podcast, she can't keep going. How long do you keep not making money for? Yeah. yeah. Oh, look, it's an ecosystem and I suppose, mm. you know, we're all part of it. So I guess we're just all, you know, 
do our bit. Yeah. Um, Barb, I'm so happy that I managed to convince you to come on to the podcast. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you and to get your incredible insights into the industry. Thank you so Always much. Always love talking to you, Danny, because you are amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Barb. See you, Catch you soon. Bye. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production.